So uh, thinking about this, how can we minimize this? So one thing could be growing things like algae. So there was already a talk on algae before, so I don't have to go through all the benefits, but algae produce, uh, you know, the main things that we need, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins, so they can't be a good food source. If you're eating algae every day, uh, even you can even get banana flavored spirulina. But um, the thing is, is that most algae though doesn't taste very good. So I was at a, uh, <laughs> so I have worked on algae for many years and, and uh, primarily for biofuels, and I love algae, but it usually tastes kind of like grass. And so I was a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution, and they had this yearbook that they published, and they worked on producing algae for foods in the 50s. And they had this really interesting quote that much has been written about the possible use of chlorella, which is a green algae, as human food, but very little chlorella has actually been eaten. And so since the 50s, I would say that it's still pretty much true, right? We have a lot of algae products in a variety of different foods, like carrageenan and ice cream, macroalgae, some of the examples we already went through, but you're not really every day sitting down to a bowl of chlorella. So I think that I still have this kind of hypothesis that in space, people are still going to want to eat the foods that they're familiar with. These foods that taste good to them, they're foods that they have cultural associations with. Right? So if you grew up eating a food or associate a certain food for a holiday, for example, you're going to want to eat that in space. Right? That's going to make you feel more at home, it's going to make you feel happier. So this gives us back to this problem. Is that to make food like this, we're going to require the production of fruits and vegetables. So how are we going to do that in a limited physical space environment like a space station? So in this limited space, can we reimagine producing fruits and vegetables, but this time without the plant? Because really, the plant is what's taking up most of that physical space. So if you can imagine a system like this, where you had a single cell of a plant, let's say a tomato stem cell, and then you could differentiate it and grow that cell, and then have it produce, let's say, a tomato, then that would be kind of the ideal system, right? Because that's using the minimum amount of space required to produce the tomato. Um, but the problem is that this isn't necessarily currently possible, right? So we don't really know all the factors and stimulus that would take to differentiate a, a tomato cell and turn it into a tomato. But so thinking about towards this kind of goal, how, what kind of experiments or progress can we make today? So I feel like there's kind of two approaches that we can get to kind of reducing the plant. And so both of these essentially reduce the non-edible portions of the plant. So the first way is kind of a bottom-up approach, and then the second way is a top-down approach. So first let's talk about this bottom-up approach. So in this case, if you take a tomato, plant and then take the cells, you can grow them and differentiate them into a callus, which is this undifferentiated cell type. And you can grow this and then you can kind of force those cells to be a specific type of cells. So if we could somehow take those cells and make them into, let's say, tomato uh, fruit tissue cells and then grow them in a fermenter, we could essentially have a whole fermenter full of tomato cells. So this would be kind of analogous to growing algae, but in this case it's tomato cells. So unlike the previous example, these cells would not become a tomato, right? They would just be the cells that are similar to a tomato, the, the cells that are the flesh of a tomato are made up of, but they wouldn't actually be a tomato. But I think that this is probably okay because uh, many food products that we have actually don't contain the full tomato or fruit product. So this is tomato soup. So tomatoes are blended up and go into products like this and so in this case, we could imagine producing many different food products this way. So here's another example. If you have potatoes, and then do the same kind of approach where you can take potato cells, and if you could establish a, a potato tuber cell culture, then you could grow that in a fermenter, and essentially you could have uh, instant mashed potatoes, if you will. Or with this similar approach, you could form it three-dimensionally and get more fancy and maybe make french fries. Okay, so now if you could make Imagine making french fries, well, instead of making tomato soup, we can make ketchup, right? So you can start to see how, using this type of approach, you can probably produce a lot of foods that we already consume. So uh, this has already been done by researchers around the world. So this is one of the, uh, oops, sorry. Sorry, it's cut off, but this is work done at uh, BTT in Finland, 
by uh, plant researchers there where they're producing a lot of food products by plant cell culture. So you can see a variety of different uh, foods and plants that they're already growing, so strawberries, cell cultures, cloudberry, which is another type of berry. So you can grow these plant cell cultures and then have these uh, products to, to blend into or use directly as foods. Okay, so that's kind of the bottom-up approach. And so the second way that we can imagine it is kind of this top-down approach, right? So if we have normal plants, like a tomato plant, if somehow we can make them smaller and smaller so that they're only producing the fruit that we're interested in and not a lot of the non-edible biomass, such as the leaves, the stems, the roots, then we could also kind of get the same uh, goal of minimizing the physical space they require to grow. So uh, the approach that we can take with this is by making uh, mutations in these plants that may cause them to be dwarfs and then stack them and kind of continue to add this and add this. So this is some work I'm doing here with Martha Orozco, who's at the UCR Plant Transformation Center. And what we're developing are lines of tomatoes that have these stacked dwarf traits. So this is a picture of uh, wild-type tomatoes grown in vitro and grown in soil. And then here's a picture of our mutant tomatoes. So these are mutated in the gene that's involved in development and DNA repair. And the resulting phenotype is a tomato that rapidly progresses through its uh, developmental cycle, flowers and fruits. And you can see that we can produce uh, fruit here in vitro on, on uh, petri dishes. And we can take it to the soil, make it a little bit bigger. You can see they're much smaller than the wild type. So what we call these tomatoes are space tomatoes, so small plants for space expeditions. And we're currently testing to see if we can get this phenotype in other crops as well. So the next part of this project that we're working on is, could we actually grow that in space-like environments? So in the space station, they have a system called the veggie system. So this is an astronaut. This is the first uh, batch of food grown on the space station in this system. And what it is, is that it's an LED on the top in a box. And then the plants are grown in these things called plant pillows. And in here, they contain a gel and a slit, and the plants grow out of this little slit, so that keeps the water and the nutrients kind of uh, partitioned and doesn't allow it to float around everywhere in space. So we're currently trying to work with uh, NASA to see how our tomatoes perform in an analog here on Earth, and eventually try to get them up onto the space station. So in conclusion, I think that if we uh, think about space, we can kind of reimagine the way we think about how to produce food. And there's kind of these alternative ways where we can try to minimize the non edible portions of a plant and be left with just the food that we really care about. And so we're currently working on this kind of top-down approach by making dwarf and smaller and smaller uh, tomato plants. And then we're trying to see how well they'll do in the space environment. And like I said, we're trying to figure out if we can replicate this phenotype in a variety of other crops, such as strawberries and peppers, eggplants, and lettuce. And finally, I think that Besides thinking about in space, we can also think about how these can apply here on Earth. So uh, a new big effort has been pushed to do kind of urban or vertical agriculture. And these types of systems, they are also physically restrained by space, like on the space station. So the crops that we can develop for space can also have a home here on Earth. And so that's all I have. If there's any questions, I guess we'll have it at the panel session next. <laughs> we have 